From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily re- represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandot, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations, present and past, who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Today is a special episode in honor of BGSU's 2022 homecoming. I have the pleasure of talking with one of the members of the 2022 class of the Academy of Distinguished Alumni. The ADA was created to recognize extraordinary accomplishments by alumni who have made significant contributions to their professional field and through their community involvement. Joining me today is Beth Macy, who earned her bachelor's degree in journalism from BGSU and is a much lauded journalist and now New York Times bestselling author of books including Dope Sick and Raising Lazarus, Hope, Justice, and the Future of America's Overdose Crisis. Beth recently won an Emmy Award for the Hulu adaptation of Dope Sick. Thanks so much for joining me today, Beth. Thanks for having me. To start, I want to congratulate you, um, not for your many honors. So certainly, I don't know if the ADA can compare with the Emmys, but uh, <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> it is what brings us together today. I would love to hear you talk about, for you, what is the role of community engagement in the public good in your work as a journalist? And has that always been something that you have seen as deeply interconnected, or has that kind of evolved over the course of your career? Yeah. So- it's definitely like top of mind right now. I grew up poor and, you know, was the first person in my family to go to college. And so I literally graduated on a Saturday, moved to Columbus, Ohio on a Sunday, started work at this crappy $200 a week journalism job, like so low entry. It wasn't even, it was like in the basement below low, low level. And so It was hard to like, you know, I had to build up social capital in order to get to the work where my values intersect what I think the public needs to know more about. And I had this aha moment probably 10 years into my career where at that point I was writing kind of bigger stories for a daily newspaper in Roanoke, Virginia, where I still live, an area of about a quarter million. So, you know, decent size, small to medium. And, um, I had opportunity finally to write about marginalized communities, you know, from which I I personally came. Um, And I realized at that moment that those were the stories that I did the best with. Like I cared more about them and they happened to intersect where, you know, I think newspapers at their best, certainly under a lot of duress these days from the way the economic decline of journalism has gone down, but at their best is are really serving as as the gatekeepers, as you know, checks on holding power accountable, and really the glue of the community. So that's the kind of work I always aspire to do, and I learned it right right here at BGSU. You know, you you just mentioned that like it took you a while to sort of build the social capital to actually be able to talk about the stories and to focus on the things that really matter to you. Could you talk a little bit, I'm thinking especially for students who are listening, about kind of how how they might navigate that and kind of what is the balancing act between sort of paying your dues, but also working towards sort of putting more of yourself into whatever endeavors um, you are starting out in? Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. When I was senior at BG, my, my favorite professor, Dr. Ray Lakanimi, or one of my favorites, he's like, stop worrying, you're going to get a job. And I had this interview, in this is before the internet, people. There really was a time. It was in York, Pennsylvania, and they were bringing me out for two days to uh, try out a newspaper feature writing job. 
And I, I didn't have a car that would make it that far. So my mom, my factory worker mom, took off work to take me in her car. She's a widow. We drive in a snowstorm to York, Pennsylvania on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. She stays in this crappy motel where they put me up for two days. And they basically don't tell me how to do anything. They give me these two assignments and it's not like you can Google it. And you're just like, you have to use your wits, right? You go out and ask strangers, how do I get to the bowling alley? And there was, I did two features and then they tried not to pay me for them at the end, which really ticked me off. But so there's a lot of lessons embedded to that. I had no actual capital. I had no social capital. And in the interview, they asked me something like, "What what's your best quality? And I said, I'm ambitious. And they're like, I, I could see them looking at each other. And of course, now from today's perspective, I just thought of this not too long ago. To them, that was a bad thing being ambitious. Or you're at least supposed to be savvy enough not to say you're ambitious, right? But somebody like me doesn't get out of poverty without being ambitious. And by God, uh, I was proud of my ambition. And maybe I didn't understand what that meant to people who weren't poor. But to me, it meant I'm going to work really hard and you're going to get, you're going to get what you pay for. And then I didn't get the job and then they tried not to pay me for it. And I had to really kind of stick up for myself. And I called them and I was like, fine that you're not giving me the job, but you said you'd pay me for those two days of work. And then once I did get a job and then working, you know, always kind of, I mean, that first crappy job that I said was lower than the low level, I was like a an intern for a stu- uh, Columbus Monthly Magazine, and I literally was responsible for updating the restaurant guide. I called every single restaurant in Columbus and asked them if they still took American Express and served tuna, really. And But so I was like, well, how do I get them to know that I'm smarter than that? And so, you know, one of this opportunity came up. They, need, they needed a, a softball player for their, their team their softball team. I played softball for years. So I was like, and then I got to know the editor really well. And then she gave me an assignment. And it's like, take those little moments of connection where you get them and do your best and show and always show that you're thinking of another way to contribute. And I remember I finally got, this was when the abortion issue was first heating up in the eighties. Like, so like many rounds ago, but I got, I got, her to let me write a profile on this one doctor that ran a clinic. And it was my first like really serious piece of journalism. But that started out like I took this crappy job, then I showed him I was serious, I took another smaller assignment, and then I got to write another piece. And I've always told, told students that always have something you're really passionate about, that you're working on, even if it's just on the side, and you're not being paid for it, so that you can piece at it in between your regular things. All of my best projects have grown out of those kinds of projects. This may connect to that, or this may be separate from it, but can you tell us how you first got interested in or aware of um, the opioid crisis? Because you've now spent many years of your career really digging into this, but how did that first spark come to you? Yeah, there was a court case here in Roanoke, Virginia, where I was Uh, working in the newsroom at the time, but I had the family speak, which basically meant I got to write about social issues. I think they thought I was going to write about mini driving moms, but, but I didn't write about that at all. I just kept coming back with irresistible stories that were stories that I wanted to write about. But there was this story on the front page of the paper that the editor latched onto, and it was a story about this young man from a wealthy high school who was about to go to prison for selling the heroin to a former uh, private school classmate of his. And so that guy had died. And now Spencer, the kid who had, I mean, they were both just using and dealing together, uh, but he was about to go to prison for five and a half years. And my editor said, I want, and, and, and his family was kind of well known. His mom had been a civic leader. She said, I want you to follow these two families. The mother who lost her son was her only child. She was divorced. She just couldn't get over it. Um, and Spencer and write about how this epidemic or this, we didn't even know it was an epidemic then about how this issue has, has upended these two families. And so I wrote this three part series, just kind of notifying people that, Hey, we've got a serious problem and it's not easy to get over because these kids were just the tip of the iceberg. These two kids were using and dealing with the prosecutor when, when, when they got Spencer's phone, 50 different kids in this wealthy suburb and readers kind of 
literally spit their coffee out and said, what? Wealthy white kids are doing heroin? We had no idea. So this is, a, this is also a story that relates to the social capital story. I had just finished my first book. It hadn't yet come out. They said, what do you want to write next? This is a, two conversations, one with my agent in New York, one with my editor in New York. And I said, I just did this last series on heroin and Roanoke, and it's really a problem. This is before we were talking about it being a problem nationally. And, and from their little perches in New York City, they hadn't seen it. And uh, they said, we think Roanoke's just late getting it as if it were a trend. And so I went on and I did a second book about something else. And then Sam Canona's book Dreamland came out. And then these economists, uh, Case and Deaton, published this groundbreaking data showing that for the first time in American history, our life expectancy was going down. I think that was 2015. And, the, and, and, and they called it due to deaths of despair, which is suicide, alcohol-related uh, deaths, and uh, mostly opioid-related deaths. So I was seeing something happening. We, we just, we were late to connect the dots. And so then I went back and I proposed Dope Sick as my third book. They said, sure. And then I got to do that. And then, um, so that's what resulted in that led to the show and then led to my latest book, which is really a follow-up to Dope Sick called Raising Lazarus. And it's, if Dope Sick was about the problem and the origins, the new one is about the solutions and how, as a nation, we too often treat people with opioid use disorder as criminals and moral failures rather than human beings with a treatable medical condition. So in that case, you know, by this point, I have enough social capital that I can kind of say what I want to write about next. But I, I always think, wow, if they would have let me do that book way back then, maybe I could have, you know, alerted the country sooner. But, you know, that's the way it happened. You know, you've, you've hit on something there with the kind of the ways those two books really kind of function together. Um, can you talk through kind of why you felt it was so important not to just end the story with Dope Sick? You had such a claim with that. There's, you know, a way in which to say, oh, I'm moving on to happier stories now. You know, what was it that you felt was not yet really um, adequately addressed? Um, you know, and I think part of this is maybe about what social need did you feel like you would be able to help fill? Yeah. Well, so Dope Sick ends really tragically with the murder of a young woman I had been following in her addiction. And I watched as she hit barrier after barrier in, in her effort to get evidence-based care. She was sent to exactly the wrong kind of rehab that didn't allow her to take medication-assisted treatment. Whenever she could get it, she would be doing better, but then she would lose access for reasons that we know are not the best practices, like she would test positive for marijuana and they'd take her off her, her um, addiction medicine. So she ends up dead on Christmas Eve of 2017. And I was so bereft by not just her death, but also just how poorly the nation was responding to it that I really, I mean, I, 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 my doctor thought I had PTSD. I was really despondent and I got help. And then I went around talking about the book, you know, over the course of the next year and a half. And I started hearing really positive things. And Back when I was a newspaper reporter, I, that's what I liked about that you would get to do a variety of topics, not just really dark things. And um, so I said, what if I pitch a book that will come out when the settlement money is beginning to funnel down to communities that also tells communities, communities could use almost as a guidebook to how best to spend the money because chances are a lot of that money is going to go into exactly the wrong practices. They're going to go to same old, same old war on drugs, incarceration first modalities, not evidence-based treatment, not diverting people from jail and into treatment. And so there was a lot of room to explore like this, this concept of harm reduction. The, the book is, the new book is really a lot about harm reduction, which is this idea of meeting people who are in use, even chaotic use, maybe they don't even want to stop using, but you're going to meet them with social supports, kindness, non-judgmental, because we know that that actually works to prevent overdose deaths and to help people achieve recovery eventually. 
but they're not going to just stop using on a dime because again, that fear of being dope sick, that fear of being withdrawal in what excruciating withdrawal, which they call being dope sick is what, what is too often driving their behaviors. You've already touched on this, but it's the impo- the topic is so important. You know, what are things you would want listeners to know about what are the best, you know, most evidence-based treatments that we know work? Um, because I think so much of, we still have this very Puritan mentality that it's a moral failing. And if you just kind of like buck up, if you want to hard enough, that that's enough. With all of your, you know, you've spent years studying this, getting to know folks, you know, what do you want people to understand about what actually drives improvements in people's lives and in their ability to get off these drugs, but also to sort of rebuild their lives in a really meaningful and productive way? Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in the new book um, hanging out with harm reductionists, and these are people who run... Um, needle exchanges in offices, but also in their cars. And they're reaching out to people who are in use and they're offering them clean needles to prevent the spread of hepatitis and HIV and connections to care. And we know that people who visit needle exchanges are five times more likely eventually to enter care. So that's a real key. And then I also wrote about people that are doing jail differently, like they are allowing harm reductionists to come into the jail and they are screening everybody for um, substance use disorder, getting them on buprenorphine or methadone if they wish, they don't press it on them. And, And that's very, very rare in our system. Usually if a person is arrested for an addiction related crime or another crime that probably is related to their addiction, and, and they're caught with drugs. They get put in jail. They have to detox there. They're dope sick in jail. They get no treatment. And then when they get out, they're 40 times more likely to overdose and die because they've been opioid naive while they're in jail. So when they return to use, they go back to their old amount. They get fentanyl, you know, and that's when people die. So we know that happens. We need to have these programs where people are picking them up at the moment and taking them to sober living, making sure they're able to get on buprenorphine, access social services and supports. Otherwise, I mean, we know from the data, we're just sending them out there, uh, too many of them to die. So I'm showing you lots of models of that in the book and also of uh, communities that make the change. You know, I, I reported this new book for like two and a half years. And this one community I write about, it's a rural town in North Carolina. You know, they start out like put everybody in jail. One woman even shouts, I think when they overdose, we should let them die and take their organs. And then how do you make change in a community where that's full of NIMBYs and CAVES, which is short for Citizens Against Virtually Everything. How do you actually convince the decision makers that this is a population worth saving? And so I show you a bureaucrat that figures out using his Marine Corps motto, he's a retired Marine, improvise, overcome, adapt, that, you know, if I can't get a volunteer group to drive people to treatment, I'm going to find this grant and I'm going to create my own staff. And we can go to people who have overdosed and get them into a post-overdose response team care. We can get them on buprenorphine. And, you know, in some cases, it's one person in a community that's leading the charge. So I want you to see those kind of gritty people on the ground. Some of them are activists. Some of them are bureaucrats. A lot of them are people with experience. They've lost loved ones. They're mothers of the dead, sisters of the dead. And and I think it's sad in this nation that we're leaving it to families to figure this out. You know, it's become so politicized. And in some communities that when change happens, it's, it's so often left to the people who've lost their loved ones. And, and I just think that's so unfair because they've lost everything. You know, they've suffered more than anyone and that's, who's leading the charge, unfortunately, but they're making a difference. One of the things we care a lot about at ICS and it clearly is a a key component of um, the ADA's focus on community engagement, but is the idea of relationships with the communities you serve that are really rich and robust and mutually beneficial. These stories that you're writing, you're in long-term 
conversation with families and bureaucrats and other folks. What do you see as some of those key skills or practices that are really necessary to building those relationships so that you can get to that deeper level? It, this one was tricky because neither side really trusted me to begin with. And you have to show that you're in it for the long game. You have to listen. If we could go back to Mount Airy, that was the community with the woman who said, let them die and take their organs. The first time I went there, I was meeting this harm reductionist there. And she wasn't sure that she wanted me to come to, to see what she was doing. Uh, but I just showed up and I, and I listened. And, and, and I always tell young reporters, you know, radical transparency. Tell them, tell them what you're doing. If it's, it's a really sensitive issue, you know, I, I, will, I will tell people, look, I, I'm not sure exactly what my angle is yet because I'm just starting, but I'll always be honest with you. I'll tell you where I'm going. I hope you'll be honest with me. I, I will fact check. I will call you. I will, you know, because what I do is I observe people over a period of a year or two, and then I'm putting what I've seen as their experience in my own words. And, and sometimes I mess it up. So I do fact check. And I will, uh, like, this is my perception of what happened. Is this how you remember it? And um, things like that. But I just think we have to be really transparent and, and really work to understand. Another thing I did in this book that I hadn't really done before is because I'm reporting all over the country and I get to know these people that are helping or trying to help. And so I'll tell like Mark and Mount Airy, like you should see what Nikki's doing in Indiana. And then he can call her or I introduced him to this innovative judge in Tennessee, and he actually had him on a little documentary that they did. So I'm just sharing what I'm seeing because I have this unusual perch of this ability to, to report from anywhere on this book. And then I'm also reporting back to the people that I'm reporting about on about what I'm seeing elsewhere, which was kind of cool. We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas Podcast. If you are passionate about big ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Beth Macy, acclaimed journalist and writer and a member of the 2022 class of the Academy of Distinguished Alumni at BGSU. Beth, I'd like to take us back to your time at BGSU as an undergraduate. Um, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the ways your experience as a student shaped your career trajectory. Absolutely. I mean, I got a BS in journalism, but I also, I got great experience. I, I told you I was a first gen student, full Pell Grant student. I had work study jobs in the financial aid office. I mixed chemicals in the photojournalism lab. I wrote press releases in the PR uh, department, which then got me published in the local Bowling Green paper and also gave me connections with people in the community, adults in the community, which was very helpful for a first gen because you feel really kind of alone and on the outside a lot. And in terms of the liberal arts, um, it wasn't until my senior year that I took creative writing, but that was really eye-opening for me. And I think that gave me a lot of interest shortly thereafter in writing feature stories. I remember the first time I wrote a feature stories for this weekly paper I was working on in Columbus and like just something clicked and I was like, this is what I want to do. And what it was is rather than reporting on everything he said, she said in the past, I was describing a moment that I saw and there was just something more alive about it. And I also felt when you, when I read it more true and they were, and it was just a little bit of a creative challenge. I'm not, I mean, I would hate to even look at that story today. It's probably terrible, but I think that taking some of those liberal arts classes like creative writing, and I took a Shakespeare class, um, I wish I would have taken more economics. Everything I write is about economics, you know? And, but when you're first gen, you just kind of do like, you're just like, you're just like lucky to be there and, and you don't know that you can you should go and really take advantage of this time. And so I was just like, I was like, check, checkity, check boxing, you know, I got to do this, I got to do this. But 
and also the photography. I did a lot of photography and that was really cool too. I I haven't done a lot with it, but it helped me see visually my stories. I will make drawings. Well, now that we have phones, so I'll, I'll take a lot of pictures when I'm reporting and I'll just stop when I'm writing a scene and I'll, I'll look at the picture and I'll, I'll have more details because you think you're going to remember everything when you're somewhere, but, it, but you don't. And that's a really kind of interesting thing that I started doing when I started, I would sketch little scenes and the way a room looked if, if I knew I was going to try to describe it, or I would, um, if I'd be somewhere that was really evocative, I would make myself go through all the senses, smell, what's it smell like? What's it, what's it sound like? What's it look like? Go through all the senses just as a double check on, I know I'm going to have to describe this later. It's a really rich scene. How do I do that? So then my job is like, I have to describe that in a full because I want the reader to have the same feeling. I want them to know what I saw, but I also want them to have the same feeling about it. So I don't want to be preachy because I don't want to like, how do I evoke the sensation of what it was like to be there? And so that's, that's always the goal. And I think it works better when you're, you're showing rather than telling or preaching. Part of, I think, what makes your book so powerful is that you are integrating this deeply personal, up-close view with the kind of wider context, with kind of additional resource, re- research and scaffolding and explanation of like the economic conditions and sort of how, like, you know, what is underlying the individual story that you're focused on. We talk a lot about, you know, critical thinking, writing, and research skills, Um, So for you, what is your research process like? You know, what are you drawing on that is your own original research? And how are you making use of work that others have done to enhance, um, you know, the stories you're telling? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, with the opioid books, because they were so of the moment, I'm reading everything I can find. I'm talking to as many experts as I can find. And at the same time, this is early on before I've decided how I'm going to structure it, I'm also looking for people whose experience aligns with what the problem is. So like when I when I met Tess Henry, that was quite by accident. A friend introduced me to her. She had found her dog was loose, and she returned the dog, and that's when she met her. And like the whole story just came tumbling out because she and her mother were having such trouble getting her into care. And so I went and I went with my radical transparency. I don't know if you'll be in the book, but I know I'll learn something. Would you mind? And they wanted people to know how hard it was. So at that point, when you've got somebody that's really close up in an issue, you're seeing it, you know it way better than the experts do because a lot of the research you know, is like years long, it's not going to be published for another couple of years after that. So I'm literally telling a lot of the experts that I'm interviewing kind of what I'm seeing on the ground. And then I'm just calling around and I'm trying to see is this can this community stand as a, as a microcosm for what's happening in other places? And how does it fit in within the scale of treating people like they're human beings to treating them like they're just criminals and where are really, I'm trying to identify the gaps in, in dope sick, uh, where people fall through the cracks. And then in raising Lazarus, I'm trying to identify where are people like patching up those cracks and how are they doing it? And, and, and so much of it's political and how are they doing an end move around this policy or taking this political risk to do something differently in the case of an elected official, because I want to know, I want people to understand that these these things work and we should be putting them to scale to match the scale of the crisis. But it's like, how do you figure out how to tell that in a way that's an interesting story that people want to read about and that they also learn from? This is my final question for you, Beth. What advice or anything you want to say to students who are kind of early in their career and are excited, but also maybe nervous about, you know, really thinking about what a meaningful life means to them um, that serves the public good. Any advice for kind of how to take those first steps? (laughs) Bless your heart is my first one. That's a very Southern thing to say, but like, like, thank you for even thinking about serving the public good. It's, it's such important work to do. It, the rewards aren't immediate, but I promise you, you will be rewarded if you keep doing the work that 
fits your values and serves the public good, you will be. You know, I wasn't, I was 50 before I published my first book. You know, and don't be afraid to ask for help, you know, when you're having a hard time. If you're having a hard time with mental health, ask, ask for help. Find a counselor. If you're having a hard time, you feel stuck in your job, you know, reach out to somebody in another field. And, you know, certainly Bowling Green was a great place because I had so many people, you know, helping me, helping launch me as a little baby writer, you know, and telling me that, you know, they saw something in me and have you tried this? Have you thought of this? You know, it's the same thing. You just build your team wherever you go. Thank you so much, Beth. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Listeners who want to learn more about the Academy of Distinguished Alumni can visit bgsu.edu forward slash alumni. Listeners can keep up with ICS by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please do subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information or to propose a guest for a future episode, you can visit us at bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Sound engineering and audio editing for this episode were provided by Deanna McKeegan and Marco Mendoza. Research assistance was provided by Joanna Simpson. Our musical introduction was created by Chris Caveira. <laughs>